And um, I'd like to introduce myself after the conversation just now. I'd like to introduce myself and uh, take possession of the moniker of a normal. I am a normal. I think, uh, with, based upon the last conversation, and um, a little bit about myself, just briefly, is that I am uh, an historian. I'm a historian of modern China and the history of technology. And I come, in essence, as a, um, an eager outsider and a kind of historical ethnographer. I am in the process of uh, what will likely be a 10-year or so project. Um, these are the timescales in which uh, my world lives. Um, and what I'm here to do is uh, continue to think through the process of a relatively simple question which is what do we mean and what, how do we tell the history of the transition from so-called exotic types or exotic faces, um, also known as oriental script, linguarum, orientalis, and these various things, into the, the new uh, uh, moniker roughly since the 1960s, 70s onward of the non-Latin, this, uh, this very bizarre term that maps in a certain sense onto other contemporaneous transitions, uh, such as the Orient into uh, East Asia, or more broadly, uh, the Orient into the non-West. So I, I just include uh, these images up here as a, as a backdrop to what I'm thinking about much more broadly. And uh, the centerpiece of the discussion in, in, in my research uh, really centers on hot metal uh, composition and the works of Mergenthaler linotype, linotype and machinery, and uh, monotype to a set lesser extent, uh, intertype for the entire scope, the entirety of the non-Latin world. Um, and I know that that sounds ridiculous uh, as a scope. I would never allow, for example, one of my students at Stanford uh, ever to write a dissertation on a subject of that nature. But the basic fact of the matter is, is uh, as I investigated the art departments in each of these companies in the 19-teens, 20s, 30s, that on a weekly basis, certainly on a monthly basis, and a yearly basis, individual uh, um, uh, draftswomen, and I'm trying to also excavate the history of gender that has been entirely erased from the history of type design, um, are on a Tuesday working on one, uh, one language, one script, on a Wednesday another, on a Thursday another, on a Friday and another. And so in a certain sense, by taking the entire non-West uh, world, non-Latin world, seriously as an historian, I actually consider myself to be faithful to how uh, many of these historical personages understood their own lives and their own work. Um, so if anyone uh, was here, uh, or not here, but at A-Type I last year, uh, um, I was the idiot that couldn't get his visa straight and had to broadcast myself in, so some of these images uh, will be reminiscent. But uh, this is one image from a, uh, a lino operation um, in the British Empire, South Asia, and of course, this is a, uh, one of the art departments or drawing departments from the Monotype Corporation. And um, one of the things that I argued in that, uh, that work and that I continue to think about is with the application of industrial capitalism to basically uh, uh, the production of, of, of typefaces um, at the turn of the 20th century, with, especially with hot metal composition, I actually consider these two uh, images, which we would take and divide in a, in a, in a certain sense. A young woman um, in a London office uh, drawing type, this would also map onto the Brooklyn office, and then a, a colonial outpost, that actually these are two sides of the same coin uh, with the application of uh, kind of a project management style industrial capitalism to uh, font production. So uh, this is something that is in the backdrop of what I've been thinking about heavily. The topic uh, for today and what I'm thinking through today is, uh, is I guess, an argument or a proposition that I, I, I wouldn't necessarily put forth as confidently. Um, no, I would not want to join it. Um, <laughs> is, uh, is, is a proposition that I wouldn't necessarily put forward with any confidence in my, in my natural habitat. Uh, but that I, I'm inspired to do because of the conversations yesterday. Uh, I was particularly blown away by Sonia's talk, which I thought she's like a walking bodhisattva to me. Now I've never met her, I don't know her, but I can just see why everyone wanted to wish her a happy birthday. Um, oh, good, okay. 
Uh, CJK is, historically speaking, um, I'm going to argue in the 19th, 20th century, uh, and particularly with the application of this industrial capitalist model, not technically part of non-Latin. Um, so uh, this is, I, I, I come, I'm a historian of China, and I spent my pathway to this project of, of the history of type design for non-Latin fonts came by way of studying the history of the Chinese typewriter which is by its very definition an object and a technology that never should have been born, it never should have existed, uh, and yet it did. And, and that was something, that was a, a conflict or an oxymoron that really I, I thought was a productive one for thinking about uh, the transformation of global power in the 19th and 20th century. Here you have a technology, uh, we could say the telegraph also, but the typewriter, linotype um, into various character encoding schemes, ASCII onward into word processing computing, all of these technologies that are utterly transforming the way we think of economy, warfare, identity, spirituality even, uh, premised, not, not required or based upon, but premised at some level upon alphabetic or at the very least alpha syllabistic uh, scripts. And then the one major world script and of course its, um, its uh, relations within East Asia of Chinese characters that is steadily being uh, expelled or excommunicated from the realm of the universal, uh, which is the, uh, the story of, of, this, uh, of the typewriter and so forth. As I was sort of looking through the, the, the archives, whether the Smithsonian or Mosey or um, the monotype offices, or I, I, I've worked in uh, 60 archives so far, uh, you begin to realize that within this larger cartography of the non-Latin, that CJK has its own um, own space. That those who would, as I mentioned, work on a Tuesday on one on one script, on a Wednesday on one script, another on one script, uh, they began to imagine themselves as taking on the entirety of world language. Uh, they, they, uh, these companies were boasting by the teens and twenties upwards of 50 scripts, 60 scripts, 70 scripts and they're imagining a totality, a, 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 a globe encompassing reach. Um, and steadily, however, uh, these companies such as Linotype, Monotype, uh, but also in the realm of typewriting, Remington, Underwood, Olivetti, IBM, basically you list up the heavy hitters of these companies over the course of the century. And Chinese characters were always beyond their grasp. And so uh, there was a special kind of, uh, a kind of subcompartment or, or orthographic ghetto within the non-Latin, which was reserved for the CJK, which is pretty phenomenal when we think of a language that accounts for roughly 20% of human civilization um, being excommunicated from this global. And so, this is uh, this is an image from the archive. I really appreciate how in this community uh, everyone's willing to put pictures of themselves on the slides. We, I don't get to do this in my natural habitat either. This is just uh, uh, at Frank Romano's uh, print museum collection. Uh, where I had to wear a gas mask because of, um, unfortunately, a mold condition. But the, the font that's in this image is the one that I want to talk about today, which was, in essence, uh, the gleaming hope for uh, Mergenthaler Linotype and also for the Monotype Corporation in the first opening decades of the 20th century. This gleaming hope that finally, ultimately, at long last, as we always knew would happen um, in human history, that China was finally going to get rid of those pesky characters and was finally going to join the realm of modern humanity and, and develop a phonetic-based uh, writing system. And this was, uh, this is sort of a forgotten uh, history in the 1920s, but it is one that uh, 1920, 1921, 1922, 1923 <coughs> gripped the imaginations and, and indeed the, the art departments of uh, five or six major uh, mechanized inscription uh, companies, or, or um, in the case of, again, Monotype, L&M, um, Remington, and so forth and so on. And this is the so-called Chinese phonetic alphabet. And it was actually developed into a font. There was a phenomenal amount of capital and human labor applied to its production. Um, and in essence, it was destined from word go to fail. And, that, and the reason for its failure was that um, contrary to the hopes and dreams and expectations of not only these companies, but arguably the entire Euro-American uh, world, 
uh, that these, uh, this new so-called Chinese phonetic alphabet that was being developed in China at the time was never meant to replace Chinese characters. It was always meant simply to teach individuals the proper pronunciation of characters. It was meant to be a parallel script, though I still don't want to join, um, a parallel script. Um, this fact, this idea, this powerful idea that eventually China will go alphabetic, uh, I want to argue or suggest, has been a, uh, a profound <clears throat> accompaniment to Western understandings of Chinese script for at least four centuries and still continues to inform our understandings uh, of the language. Um, this is the book on the Chinese typewriter, which is coming out next year on MIT Press. Okay, um, the other thing that I like to uh, study is, uh, I guess, the, the unsung uh, eccentrics and the, the, the unexamined, um, everyday and by, his, by history forgotten individuals who in the teens and 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s were, because of this powerful and growing incongruence between global information technological systems and the Chinese script that was being excommunicated steadily by these systems, you had a series of engineers, linguists, artists, uh, educators, library scientists, reading, uh, I, um, reading psychologists, entrepreneurs, uh, everyday uh, users of technologies of Chinese descent, non-Chinese descent, who were drawn or magnetized to the, the Chinese puzzle. That is the question of how in the world, again, do we render the Chinese script as a non-alphabetic script compatible with this whole family of technologies that really depend, in a certain sense, upon technology. I put up one example uh, that I'm not going to talk about uh, in depth, but I do want to just spotlight. This is uh, the work of a, a young um, and very talented overseas Chinese student who studied at NYU in the 19-teens, uh, who was trying to develop a, a concept of a Chinese typewriter that would, um, that would take Chinese characters and explode them into the component character parts out of which Chinese characters are, are, are built, um, and set each of these components up on top of one of roughly 1,300 metal sorts, and then allow one to not spell in sound the Chinese language, but to spell in shape the Chinese uh, script. His system, uh, did, he built a prototype, he tried it out to, uh, to investors, it lost out to another model of Chinese typewriter, um, and he has since been sort of erased uh, by time. And in a certain sense, he had anticipated many of the conceptual artists that now receive a, a, a profound uh, and, and deserved uh, uh, recognition by not only the design community, the art community, but also the information technological community. In essence, he had anticipated uh, what uh, Xu Bing, the famous uh, conceptual Chinese artist Xu Bing, is now famous for, but is entirely lost and forgotten history. And there are, for every one individual, this, his name is uh, Qi Xuan, there are dozens and dozens of others who uh, form an archive that is really waiting for um, not typographic revivalism, but I would argue for, um, for conceptual revivalism. So this is another dimension of the work that, 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 uh, that occupies my mind. Um, okay, so the story begins that I'd like to talk about begins in 1899 uh, in China, um, and, uh, or an access between China and Great Britain when the Chinese minister in London at the time, uh, uh, this gentleman, uh, Luo Fenglu, who uh, his name is rendered uh, in the horizontal at one place and the vertical in another, this is just to indicate that uh, at this point, 1899, in Chinese textual practice, that the reforms of the 19 teens and 20s, the, the horizontalization of the Chinese language that was undertaken then, had not yet taken place. Um, and this will be important in, in a second. He, as minister to Great Britain, is doing an industrial tour of plants um, and industrial factories of, across Great Britain. And one of the, fact, one of the factories that he visits um, is the Linotype factory, uh, then in, in, um, based in uh, Manchester, but he also makes uh, trips to other places, Broadheath and elsewhere. And uh, he's particularly taken by this technology of hot metal <laughs> composition, for obvious reasons. Uh, I won't go into the history of it, but, um, but he had remarked in passing that 
the, this particular technology might not be conducive to a non-alphabetic script. Uh, the, the minor type officers were trying to convince him that, yes, in fact, this could be conducive. We hear stories of, of engineers building typewriters for Chinese, so maybe there's hope for a minor type. And he quipped that, well, at the very least, the name would have to change because, of course, Chinese is uh, written in the vertical. And so what we would need to rename the minor type is as the columna type. So instead of a line of type, it would be a column of type, and you would have, um, in essence, uh, the, the reimagination of what this technology would need to look like. Not only that, but this column of type would need to be uh, reversed um, and reorient the entirety of the Chinese script on the, on the uh, at a basically a 45 degree rotation, because of course the linotype within and of itself is a fundamentally embedded horizontal production system. It cannot write in the vertical. And so what we would need to do is have every single one of our graphemes rotated 45 degrees, um, uh, or 90 degrees, excuse me, and then set uh, to form a column type. So there was this dream, this idea, as with so many other commodities at this time, and with the commodification of typography, that there was uh, no difference, really, of breaking into the Chinese markets. And uh, this was not only true for the, the technology of linotype, but was already true for the technology of the single keyboard, single shift keyboard typewriter, in which companies, not only uh, uh, Remington, but also Underwood and, uh, and later Olivetti and so forth, took great <coughs> pride in the fact that their machines were being found in, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in the Middle East, in South Asia, um, in, in East Africa, in Southeast Asia, and so forth. And the exact same story that I've just outlined for Linotype is exactly true for the typewriter. None of these companies ever succeed in breaking into the Chinese market. Um, now, uh, who will get blamed for that failure to break into the Chinese market we will come back to. But this represents the one gleaming omission in this otherwise very tidy story of technological universalism that these companies want to put forward. Um, now, technically speaking, LNM, or Linotype of Machinery, does have a presence in China at this time, around the turn of the century. And this is a topic that I talked about uh, via satellite uh, in Sao Paulo, so I won't go into it. But circa 1900 through 1910, uh, there are a number of, of uh, Lido operators in Shanghai, Beijing, and elsewhere, but they are setting the English language. This is true also basically the beginning of what I call the hot metal empire, because it maps so perfectly onto the contours of the British Empire, French Empire, the emergent American Empire in Singapore and elsewhere, Philippines. Um, the goal of this first phase of the hot metal empire is to decentralize colonial um, infrastructure, colonialist infrastructure, so that the colonies are able to print their own materials rather than have them sent from the colonial metropole, basically to make colonialism pay for itself. We're going to um, ship these uh, linotype machines and then train so-called native operators in the setting of English. And as I talked about last time, I would argue that uh, even though, of course, there, there, are, there are stories of uh, scriptoria, of people writing out uh, texts that they themselves could not read, nevertheless, the scale of this venture, uh, uh, it stands to reason that at the turn of the century, we have for the first time in human history a very large number of non-English speaking individuals setting the English language in type uh, on a massive industrial scale motivated by um, this colonial decentralization and having the colonies pay for themselves. Now, just some images. This is from China. Uh, this is uh, from the Philippines. Um, this is uh, uh, various places in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and so forth, and you get the idea. So the first phase of the hot metal empire is the set setting of English and the training of native operators to do this. Very quickly, in most of the rest of the world, actually, for the rest of the hot metal empire, this gives way to a second chapter in this history, and that is a chapter of the production of non-Latin fonts or exotic faces, exotic types for local newspaper markets. So now we're going to try to sell these machines, which of course is where the company makes their money. Um, and then the software for the machines are the fonts in their local language. So this maps pretty well onto earlier ideas of hardware and software, where the software is free, the hardware is what you pay for, and then of course that transitions later in life 
uh, in the 60s and 70s to a software-dominated economy in any way. This is not true for the Chinese case. China, Chinese script is the one major, uh, it's, not, it's the one subset and a major one at that that never makes this transition to the second, his, second chapter of the history of the hot metal empire. I'm not including cold metal type, of course, hot metal made movable type cold, so of course that's an anachronism, but so-called movable type cold metal fonts I'm not including in this, which still has its own history. But in this new phase of hot metal composition, which of course bleeds into the story of photo setting and so forth so powerfully, Chinese is not part of this story at all. Well, this changes very soon. There's this orientation again, which goes back deeply into the 19th century, which I term or I nickname Waiting for Cadmus. Cadmus as the, uh, the mythological founder of Thebes, brother of Europa, credited with bringing uh, the Phoenician alphabet to the Greeks, which then begins, well, at what I would assume 70% of the people here work on, which is that great tradition that we, that we valorize and so forth. Um, and this idea that we would, we're waiting for the Chinese Cadmus. We're waiting for him to make his circuitous route through time. He's already brought his, uh, his, his wares to uh, uh, the rest of the world. When will Cadmus show up in China? Well, it seemed that he had arrived. In 19, around 1919, uh, the, the uh, Chinese uh, newspaper Guo Yubao had published this issue. Um, it wasn't the first instance of this, but had given rise to something that was being termed the National Phonetic Alphabet. Um, I won't go into what each of these graphemes mean, but these are not Chinese characters. They're derived from Chinese characters, actually from ancient Chinese characters. But they have purely uh, initials, medial, finals, phonetic elements. Uh, this basically caused a massive stir in the uh, community of, uh, of uh, linotype, monotype, Remington, Olivetti, the entire industrial capital uh, typographic world went nuts. Finally, we can break into the Chinese market because the Chinese themselves, not missionaries that had tried before, but the Chinese themselves had finally woken up, and now they're going, going to come, as, they, as we knew they inevitably would, to the alphabet. And therefore, we can come into this story and begin to make money. These are from the, these are from the archives of Mergenthaler Linotype. Um, uh, the, the, these became the models. They're cut up and sort of sorted out. And what ensues at Linotype, uh, Mergenthaler Linotype, in partnership, of course, with a kind of licensee, or there's different legal arrangement with Linotype and machinery, and Monotype sets its drafts women on the, the, the task of it. It's, it's overseen by Augusto Capitanio, who reports to Chauncey Griffith. Augusto Capitanio was born in Padua, but he immigrates to the United States. Apparently, he was a very gentlemanly, very charming man, a good musician. Um, and he was responsible for overseeing the Katakana project, the Sinhalese project. Uh, he was basically their go-to non-Latin guy. Um, the actual, the actual non-Latins were all drawn by women. Uh, Dorothy Arbogast, Dorothy Reichert, uh, people you have never heard of, Mabel Doré, uh, people that I can, the one thing I'm very good at in, in life is finding things, um, especially when I begin to have basic demographic information, names, birthplaces, and so forth. Uh, it is profound how difficult it is to find the histories of these uh, early 20-year-old women uh, who basically as a community drew the entire non-Latin uh, library of places like monotype, monotype and machinery. Um, for, uh, these are some of the examples of, from the Mergenthaler linotype. They basically set to work over the course of uh, not, not dedicated universal, to not um, you know, entirely occupied time, but three straight years, uh, the Chinese phonetic alphabet font will dominate um, the, the attention of this entire, uh, uh, basically the entire uh, type community, including typewriter community. These are just some examples of the letter forms. Now, there is something, this is one from the monotype archives. This is the one that I referred to as yification in my uh, video for the last type, type I. Now, there was a problem um, with this, which uh, is actually shown better. Oh, well, here is the announcement of it, China's National Phonetic Syllabary. I won't go into um, how it has been adapted to the linotype by the Mergenthaler Linotype Company. Remington publishes uh, an article in its internal Remington uh, newsletter, which is titled something to the effect of, uh, a, finally, a Chinese typewriter of Remington. Uh, this was basically a civilizational scale announcement. 
that we had finally entered this world that had so persistently kept us out. Now, there was a problem with this, uh, which in a certain sense they were aware of, the development of the keyboards, um, the development of the keyboards and so forth, the phenomenal amount of energy put forward to this. And this is coming to the end of this discussion. But um, there was a problem to this that the community at all of these companies were sort of aware, not aware of, in a kind of semi-liminal, dreamlike state. They, in the one hand, they knew what the purpose of the Chinese phonetic alphabet was, that it was meant to be, as you can perhaps see, a kind of parallel script that would always, always run alongside Chinese characters that would, in some way, shape, or form, need to be printed on the page um, in order to indicate the pronunciations of these characters. As many of you probably know, there are many mutually unintelligible dialects in China, and so one was, this was part of a, a kind of pedagogical nationalism effort as well. Um, and it was always meant to accompany and sideline Chinese characters. There was a sense in which this was known. But again, for this waiting for Cadmus anticipation, the eventual alphabetization of Chinese, there was a sense in which somehow this augured the beginning of the inevitable tours. So therefore, we should invest in this, in this alphabet. Um, and ultimately, however, this original goal, this original purpose for this phonetic alphabet as it was designed in China actually did persist. It never uh, was designed to, nor did it ever replace the Chinese character language. And just to close, when this project fails, and it fails in the, it fails over the course, it's, it's a sort of a slow car crash over the 1920s. Um, it's never, no one ever really wakes up and says, it has been a failure. But there's a sense in which it just sort of bleeds out and, and, and disappears from historical memory. That there's an emergence of a new uh, cliche or a new trope that surrounds the Chinese script with, as it exists within the realm of mechanized print, typography, and later computation, and so forth, which is that the Chinese script is at fault for its own technological poverty. Okay? So the reason that we all, we universals, we who have taken over the world, we who have offices in Rangoon, and we who have offices in Yerevan, and we who have offices all the way in here and there, the reason that we universals at IBM, Remington, Linotype, Monotype, Linotype and Machinery, and so forth, can't enter into this world is because of its inscrutable, resistant anti-modernity. And you begin to see really violent, but sort of visually violent uh, uh, tropes that surround the inherent anti-modernity of the Chinese script, um, which continues really throughout the entire, the, into the present day, um, but is beginning to loosen. But coming back to the final point, and then you have uh, notes like this, which are statements to the universal. This is from Olivetti. Le macchine Olivetti scrivono in tutte le lingue. Unless, uh, that is only true if we rule out 20% of hum humankind. Uh, then, yes, it is in tutte le lingue. Um, so these are the kinds of images that we, that we sort of occupy. So coming back to this question of what exactly is this transition from exotic to non-Latin, um, I, I'll close with something from The Matrix, which I often like coming back to. There's that moment in The Matrix where the agent is talking to, to Neo and says, you know, I've done a study of, your, of, of, of humans and I've decided you're not mammals. Um, you're in fact something, you're something parasitic. And this is a definition based not on classification, but based upon behavior or how it exists in the world. And I like that way of defining things. And what I'll say is that, uh, coming back to the original point, CJK, as it has existed, as it, not as it's classified, it is technically non-Latin, but in its life form, in the way that it has lived its life in the 19th and 20th century with uh, regards to all of these new information technologies and type technologies, is effectively uh, not a non-Latin. Um, it occupies some kind of, of territory unto itself, which I would argue, as we just saw in this talk by, by, uh, um, by our, our colleagues at Founder Type, is beginning to uh, change. Uh, but there's still a very, very long way to go. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and I appreciate it.